talk is going to be uh, by Dr. Son Niem from NAS NASA JPL. He's going to talk about the geophysical contradistinction between Arctic and Antarctic sea ice change. And Son, we're already running five minutes behind, so. All right, sir. Another five minutes to that. All right, sir. Uh, forward, back, laser pointer. Uh, first, thank you, Pablo, for the introduction and uh, uh, good morning. So. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the contributions of my uh, colleague uh, to this research, uh, Ignatius Rieger from University of Washington, Pablo here, uh, Don Perovich and Chris Polazemski from Corel, uh, Greg Newman and Peggy Lee also from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, so the objectives uh, is uh, really uh, simple here. Uh, the first. Uh, objective is we want to examine the differences uh, between Arctic and Antarctic uh, sea ice uh, change uh, to address the sea ice uh, paradox, uh, which is uh, why the Arctic sea ice has been reducing, not just reducing, but reducing drastically, whereas the Antarctic sea ice has been stable or even slightly increased. And the uh, second science objective, I think, which is also important is to identify the factors that can be the basis that allow CI's forecast and prediction. Uh, so with that, with that, let's take a look at the Arctic sea ice. Uh, you, see, you see here the, um, the, the synoptic uh, sea ice class, which is our hi hypothesis to say that its change is actually a double jeopardy for the drastic uh, reduction of the Arctic sea ice. So in the Arctic, we have uh, uh, primarily two types of the uh, sea ice. One is the perennial sea ice, which is the old thick sea ice that can uh, survive at least one summer, or you can understand this uh, in group, both the uh, second year ice and the multi-year -year sea ice, that it can be thick and it is important to the ice mass and the ice back stability in the Arctic. The second type of ice is what we call seasonal ice, that kind of ice that grow and melt uh, seasonally every year. Uh, and then it includes the marginal uh, uh, ice at the ice edge, which is a feeble uh, kind of ice, which is thin and weak and easily uh, melted and decreased. Um, so let's take a look here. What we show here, the white area, which is the perennial sea ice, and the bluish area here, which is the seasonal sea ice. And this is for 2001. And you can see just a few, a few years after that, uh, it reduced tremendously. And then if you look at the long-term um, change of that perennial sea ice, and by the way, we show here is the condition uh, in March. Uh, which is the transition uh, into the springtime. Uh, the uh, data that you see in the uh, open uh, diamond uh, here is from the Drift H model. In, actually, it is a uh, data simulation from the uh, buoy measurement that uh, with the buoy tracking, you know uh, how long the eye has been staying in the Arctic, and then this, this model would kind of use that information uh, to determine uh, whether the sea ice uh, stay in the Arctic long enough to call it perennial ice. Uh, so in the uh, 50 and 60, you don't see any uh, discernible change, but in the uh, three decades after that, uh, from the 70, 80, and 90, the decrease of the perennial sea ice extent in March is about half a million square kilometer per decade. But look what happened in the 2000, which is the first decade of the 21st century. You have a precipitous decrease, which is triple the loss rate in the previous decades. Uh, and it is verified uh, by the uh, observation from the NASA uh, scatterometer data, which is the, uh, the black square in here, so it's validate uh, the result from the TRIF H model using the buoy data. And uh, the reason why there's such a loss, because in the um, uh, uh, 2000s, uh, there's more and more of that uh, dipole pattern in the Arctic. Basically, it merged the wind together and uh, accelerate the uh, polar tr uh, TRIF uh, that pull the Arctic sea ice uh, along uh, the direction 
Uh, the, uh, if you look at the bathymetry of that, you can see that it is along the Lomonosov Ridge and the Gatko Ridge. So you think of it as a channel, and the wind blew on it, and then it just pushed the ice uh, out of the Arctic, and then it went down to the Greenland Sea, where you see that the uh, warm water from the uh, Gulf Stream come up and melted. You can think of it uh, this way. You go to your refrigerator, right? Take the ice out of the refrigerator, put it on your kitchen sink, and pour hot water on that. That can be a very effective way to lose the sea ice. So it's not <laughs> losing the sea ice in, uh, in space, uh, in place, but it's the dynamic that caused that loss, right? Uh, and why is it a double jeopardy here now that is uh, more dominated by the seasonal ice. The seasonal ice, by definition, is the younger ice, the thinner ice. So you start with the thin ice uh, already. But then on top of that, the uh, seasonal ice is flat. So if you take a cup of water, pour it on your table, the water spread out very quickly, immediately, and the, the, uh, is, is the male pond. And the male pond has a lower albedo, which allows more solar heat absorption. Whereas for the, for the uh, perennial sea ice, is typically rough, so these water pull it in a smaller area, but deeper. Therefore, the uh, albedo uh, of that cannot re uh, reduce that much. So with that, uh, I show here one example uh, from the satellite observation with the high resolution data. And you can see here, this is the smooth, a smooth seasonal sea ice. It looks darker. It's kind of like you wear a hot uh, a, a, a black shirt, go out in the sun, and you stand in the sun for five minutes. You know how hot it's going to get, right? Um, and then the uh, a perennial sea ice, you see here, it ponded in, into a smaller area, and therefore, it's kind of like a, you wear a wire gray shirt out there, and so it can get kind of warm, but not that bad. <coughs> so with, uh, with that, um, what I want to uh, discuss here uh, is that you, you see here, this is a, um, uh, from the National Climate uh, Assessment Report, which is a um, uh, uh, showing here is the uh, model uh, for the um, representative uh, uh, concentration pathway uh, with the 2.6 watt per meter, which is uh, slightly heating to uh, 8.5 watt per meter, which is a very strong heating. And even with that, uh, it cannot explain uh, the uh, record of the, perennial, uh, of the total sea ice extent in the September period, which is at the end of the uh, sea ice season. And you can see here, none of this. It doesn't matter how you put the heat in there. It cannot explain this trend. Uh, so why is that? If you took at the, the March condition that I showed earlier, uh, you can see here is that it really captured that trend. Let me push back and forth a little bit here that you can see that. So why is that? Because in March, it already uh, show you how much of that Arctic sea ice composed of the perennial ice, which is kind of like a wearing a, wet sh uh, a white shirt, and how much of that, which is more dominant by the seasonal sea ice, is like wearing a black shirt. So in March, you already know beforehand how much you're going to get warm by wearing the black shirt. And that would dictate how much of the solar heating that would be absorbed that. And with that, you can kind of capture the decrease uh, trend in the uh, total CI extent in summer. So I flip back and forth for you to see here. So it captured that very well. Uh, another very important factor is actually the um, uh, warm water discharge from the river. And this, I have not heard anything from the previous talk since the last two days, how the terrestrial heating through the river discharge interact with the Arctic sea ice. And here I show one example. You can see this is the uh, uh, mouth of the Mackenzie River, and it's released a massive amount of hot water going to the Arctic uh, and then melt the sea ice. But remember, uh, warm, fresh water is lighter, so it stays on the surface, and then it can melt sea ice very effectively. Uh, the way it works is very interesting. Before the uh, warm water can be released by uh, the river, there is a land fast ice that cover the mouth of the Mackenzie River. And it is, again, controlled by the bathymetry. 
So the bathymetry holds this uh, ice back as a barrier, and more and more of the water, which get warmer and warmer as it go into further into the spring and the summer season. And then once it break away from that uh, land fast ice, which was uh, controlled by the bathymetry, then it's released a massive amount of uh, heat that go into the uh, ocean and melt that. Um, and then if you take a look of the entire Arctic uh, region, uh, in here there's a, a 72 uh, river that discharge into the Arctic. And uh, I published this uh, result in a GRL uh, paper. And uh, the estimate of the total heating uh, uh, energy that we list into the Arctic is about 10 exabytes uh, exajoule per year, but one degree above uh, uh, freezing. Uh, so probably you are not uh, kind of imagine how big this energy is, but let me put it in this way. This is equivalent to 2.5 gigatons of TNT per degree per year above the freezing. So if you take like uh, the amount of uh, warming just like as cold as the wine that you chew in your refrigerator, multiply this number by five or ten times. Now let me give you a very interesting homework, and you can actually do it right now. Go to your Google, right? Search how much TNT equivalent that the Hiroshima bomb is. And then you take this number, multiply it by five or ten, divided by the Hiroshima number, you will shock yourself to see how many Hiroshima bombs that the river put in the Arctic each and every year. Um, all right, but then let's took, uh, take a look at the Antarctic. There's no such a river. It's basically a frozen continent, and that is one of the stark uh, contrasts between Arctic and Antarctic. So with that, we take a look now at the Antarctic sea ice. Um, so you see here the polar sea ice paradox saying that uh, there is a um, um, stability in the Antarctic sea ice or even slightly increasing. So to address this issue, we need to look at a number of science questions that are interrelated. Uh, first of all, what is it that produced that the Antarctic sea ice so effectively? If you make a lot of money, you go to Las Vegas, you spend all of that, then you still have nothing. So the second question is that what is it that protect the Antarctic sea ice cover? And then those factor has to be sustained there in the Antarctic. If you have a protecting factor, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not, then it's not very effective. So uh, why, uh, why is it sustained there? And then what caused the regional variability? Because in the Antarctic sea ice, also the overall trend is stable or slightly increases. But regionally, some region you have a decrease, some region you have a very stable, and some region you have an increase a little bit in the Antarctic uh, sea ice extent. And then whatever reason you explain all of that, it has to be consistent among all of these factors. Because if can explain one part of it, but contradict to another part, then it still doesn't work. What is also very important is that the same physics, because physics is physics. I mean, if, if you use it for the Antarctic sea ice, it has to be applicable to Arctic sea ice too, but then why they have an opposite uh, trend in the Antarctic and Arctic uh, sea ice. So this is what we are looking at. So to, uh, okay, somehow it's not. All right, <clears throat> so there has been a number of uh, explanation or hypothesis trying to explain that, uh, one of which is that there is an also change that somehow um, make the region uh, cooler and increase the uh, Antarctic uh, sea ice. However, there are counter argument that is not effective enough. There are other uh, hypotheses say the, because of the lower salinity density, in the near surface that weaken the uh, mixing or the enhancement of the whole thermohalocline stratification 
uh, basically the melt water which is fresher that go up to the surface and then make it fresher and they're easier for the sea ice to freeze. Uh, however, as you know, if some of you already go into the Antarctic, you know how strong the wind over there. So the mixing is not a very effective, uh, I mean the, the requirement for the uh, quiescent condition is not very effective because of the strong mixing there and some other hypothesis uh, saying it's because of the wind intensification. Anyway, let's take a look at what kind of ice that we see in the Antarctic. Here I show the 10 year of data in the uh, September uh, period, which is the maximum extent of the Antarctic sea ice. Uh, so Antarctic sea ice is almost uh, come and go every year. So it's, it's kind of like a seasonal ice, uh, only very little that can survive that. But then you can see here, we can even classify that into different kind of ice. Uh, you see that the darker uh, cyan color here is a younger ice and the thicker older ice is at the outer part of it. And you see in all year it form a, what we call the frontal ice zone that surrounded and encapsulated the Antarctic sea ice cover. And uh, it act like a protective uh, 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 zone that protect the internal sea ice. So what happened here is I show here that's how it looked like over there is th the total opposite of the uh, marginal ice zones in the Arctic. And then you can see here uh, that the I in the internal of the, the, the sea ice, right, then you can see that uh, because it's thinner, so it can grow pretty effectively and then uh, it can produce a lot of ice in this way. And what driving that is the uh, wind in, in here, there's uh, this paper that show that uh, if you look at the wind, it's basically controlled by the topography of the Antarctic sea ice. And then you, uh, you can see that the Antarctic topography would shape the, the, the wind direction, including uh, the, the, the um, catabatic wind. And you can see here there's a split in the uh, two-way uh, uh, in the Rossi. So let's take a look at this um, uh, sea surface temperature. The another factor that control that is the, um, uh, okay, let me see here, is the, um, uh, the boundary between the warm and the cold water, which is called the Southern Antarctic Circumpolar uh, Front, uh, is determined by the uh, bathymetry oops, that you see here. Um, uh, so the bathymetry would control where the hot and the cold water is and that would determine where the uh, sea ice is. And then you can see uh, here that uh, if you look at the uh, Kowalan Plateau, you can see a trough there and it's actually the, the, the sea surface temperature follow that very closely, even squeeze through that trough. So if you look at the Antarctic, basically is uh, encircled by the bathymetry that protect the uh, sea ice by determining where the hot and the cold water is, uh, except for the area here that the Bellingshausen Sea and the Amundsen Sea, you don't see any feature. So the bathymetry lose control and therefore it's allowed the uh, uh, climatic factor to affect this and this area can lose the sea ice because of that factor. So in general, the Antarctic sea ice is controlled by both the topography and the bathymetry, which are geological factor rather than climatic factor. That's why it's so stable. Uh, when we address this, we inadvertently uh, solve another mystery, uh, which you see here there are two islands, the Bouvet Island and the Hurt Island. Both of them are in the Southern Ocean, and both of them are about a thousand miles away from the uh, Antarctic continent shore. But the Bouvet Island is covered by thick glacier and it has sea ice surrounded each and every year. The reason is very simple because it's in the south of the boundary in the cold sides of the ocean, whereas the Hurt Island, you have a vegetation cover and the sea ice never reach it because it stay in the north of the uh, boundary in the hot sides. Uh, so if you take a look at it in terms of the uh, sea ice property, the Antarctic circumpolar ice is surrounded by the thicker older ice, whereas the, uh, the opposite in the Arctic where it's, uh, uh, you have uh, the marginal ice 
are at the near the ice edge, which is very easily to be decreased when the uh, go into the melt season. If you look at the atmospheric uh, atmospheric forcing, the Antarctic wind actually create the ice factory that I explained earlier, and then recirculate that ice versus in the Arctic wind that cause the sea ice loss. That, like I say, that it pull the ice out of the Arctic, like uh, you take the ice to your uh, kitchen sink and uh, melt it. In terms of the ocean forcing, you see the Antarctic bathymetry constrain the location of the boundary between the hot and the cold water, whereas the Arctic bathymetry is responsible for mechanism that actually aggravate the sea ice loss, for example, the way that it control uh, the uh, release of the uh, river discharge, uh, as well as the Lomonosov ridge and the Gekko ridge that uh, kind of shape the direction where the ice can be exported out of the Arctic. So with that, I can take uh, questions, or if you have more questions, you can always send me an email at this address. Thank, Thank you, Sana. We will send you an email. All right.